Live. Good evening, this is Leo Gilling. Uh, Leo Gilling coming to you from the studios of the Leo Gilling Show and also on jamaicans.com. This evening we have with us uh, panelists and we're going to be speaking on the realities of teenage parenting challenges and outcome. This panel discussion this evening is brought to you by the Jamaica Diaspora Parenting and Other Abilities Task Force uh, presenting this panel discussion with you this evening. I want to first turn this over. I'm sure we're gonna have a wonderful evening and I'm gonna turn this over to the moderator, Mrs. Ingrid Paird Wilmot. Ingrid, are you there? Yes, I'm here. All right. All right, so. Um, so I should definitely introduce this wonderful Ingrid Parrot Wilmot, right? Um, so I know we've been having a, a, a few difficulties technical, but I think I can do it. Mrs. Parrot Wilmot has worked in both the private and public sector and has over two decades of experience in teaching at the secondary and territory levels. Mrs. Woolman is the founder of Empowering Youth at Risk Through Entrepreneurship, which is a nonprofit organization to assist unattached youth and LASCO uh, Masterclass, which is a mentoring program. Because we don't have enough time to just tell you everything about the wonderful job that this woman has been doing in Jamaica, we will just just without further ado, just welcome tonight, Ingrid Peart Wilmot. Thank you so much, Donna. It's it's a pleasure being here. And um, as we go into the topic that we're talking about this evening, I want to introduce to you our panelists. Um, we're talking this evening, as as um, Leah would have pointed out, we're talking about um, teenage parenting. And so I want to first introduce to you um, our first panelist, and that is Dr. Zoe Simpson, um, who is the Executive Director of the Women's Center of Jamaica. Um, Dr. Simpson is a lifelong learner who believes that education is a reliable vehicle that transports individuals out of poverty. Her own educational journey saw her completing doctoral studies at the University of Sheffield, England. Her doctoral thesis was, tit was titled uh, The Reintegration of Teenage Mothers into the Formal School System, uh, Redeeming the Secondary Chance to Complete Secondary Education. Dr. Simpson considers herself, um, her life to be a mission of um, positioning the next generation to identity and realize purpose for their lives. She presently serves as the executive director of the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation, where, where adolescent mothers are presented with the opportunity to continue their education during the period of their pregnancy. Dr. Simpson is driven by the philosophy that we should all live before we die. And so I'm gonna ask at this time that um, Dr. Simpson will come in and just speak about her mission with the, with the Women's Foundation and um, after that, we will continue the conversation with Dr. Simpson and the other panelists. Dr. Simpson, welcome. It's good to have you this evening. Thank you so much, Ingrid, for that warm welcome and introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. My pleasure indeed to share with, with, with the listeners about the work of the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation. We started in 1978 when the rate of adolescent pregnancy in the island was round about 31%. Of course, that was no good for the process of nation building. And so with that reality, the government of Jamaica at, at the time um, introduced and implemented the program for adolescent mothers. The program therefore was mandated to provide the adolescent mothers with the opportunity to continue their pregnancy during, continue their education during the period of their pregnancy. The girls, therefore, they are with the program uh, for about one year. 
and they are given the intervention which entails academic instructions. So we operate pretty much like the school system. All the subjects they would do at school, they are doing that at the women's center. And we have intense counseling so that the girls can understand themselves, understand what it is to make good decisions and how to be resilient and how to be good parents and, 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 and how to hurdle their challenges. Um, and, and we do a little bit of skills training also so that their education continues to be rounded and the girls are grounded. And, and yes, they go back to their communities and the struggle is how therefore to help them to realize potential and to, and to see life from a different perspective as against what they are exposed to in their communities. But we continue across the island. We have 18 centers and, and we, are mad, we, are, we are provided with a budget from the government of Jamaica. We are positioned under the umbrella ministry um, of, the, of culture, gender, entertainment, and sports. And yes, we are very happy to be under that ministry that focuses on the fact of gender equality and gender equity and gender empowerment. The thinking is that whereas something is happening in the bellies of these girls, their minds are still fresh and alert. And yes, contrary to popular belief that the girls are worthless and the girls are unambitious, we hear their stories and we hear their voices as they tell their stories that yes, they really do want the opportunity to continue their education. So we walk with them through the process of the pregnancy and prepare them for the delivery. In a number of instances, we recognize that a girl will be going to, to have her baby and she has absolutely nothing. There's no familial support in a number of instances. We, we invite the parents in therefore for them to understand also that if this girl is going to, to, to fulfill her, her potential, then she will really need the support of her parents and the support of the community. In a, given, in a number of instances, we know that as they come to the centers, they're, they're, they're exposed to a lot of assault on the road, they're exposed to discrimination, and even when they go back to school, because the mandate really is for the girls to be reintegrated into the formal school system after they've had their babies. There is the reintegration policy that makes it mandatory for the schools to accept the girls, as a matter of fact, to, to, to keep their places in the school system. So after they've had their babies, it's a seamless transition back to school. Um, a few years ago, the, the policy was introduced and passed by cabinet in 2013. Prior to that, the centers had to beseech the principals to take the girls back. But with the policy, it is a seamless transition and we're very thankful for that. We recognize though that the girls, when they go back to school, sometimes they are still at risk of dropping out a second time and you will you will agree with me that it doesn't it's not helpful for them to have been through the program for one year and then go back to school and then drop out a second time. So what we now do is we monitor their progress when they are reintegrated. We walk beside them for as long as we need to, to ensure that they complete their secondary education, to ensure that there is a delay of a second pregnancy, and yes, to encourage them to also matriculate for tertiary level education. The support we give the girls when they are reintegrated constitutes mentorship, sponsorship, because in a number of instances, they can ill afford the school expenses going back to school. And you can appreciate that because now it's not just a girl going back to school. It's a girl who is a mother. Yes. And she has the, 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 the needs of her child that must be met. And yes, sometimes it is, it is either the, 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 the lunch money for the girl or, or the, the welfare needs of the, of the child that must be met. We say to the young girl, because you must complete and we want to ensure that you complete, we will assist you financially to ensure that your, your school expenses are, 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 are met. And we'll, we will also provide you with a mentor who will walk beside you to help you to hurdle the challenges of going back to school as student and mother. Over the many years since 1978, when we started, the second pregnancy rate, and this is one of our successes, the second pregnancy rate has remained below 2%. And we're happy for that because we recognize that sometimes they drop out a second time. In the first instance, 
they dropped out on account of the first pregnancy. And in some instances, they drop out a second time on account of a repeat pregnancy. To, to ensure that um, that second pregnancy is delayed, we introduce each girl to a contraceptive method, to the use of a contraceptive method. And yes, I can hear the questions being thrown at us that that's a legal matter. Yes, it is, we know that. So we invite the parents therefore to sign, to say they give us permission to discuss, have this discussion with the girls and to, to introduce them to, to, to the variety of methods. The parents also are in on the conversation. Remember I said that the success of the girl is going to be dependent in a lot of instances on the extent to which she has the parents' support. So the parents are into the conversation about contraceptive methods. The parents are reminding the girls that they need to take their methods kind of a thing and so on. So that is how we treat with that legal matter of the fact that um, several of the girls are still on the age and that becomes um, a legal matter. Uh, we, we interface with the boys because if there's a girl who is pregnant, there's a boy somewhere, a young man somewhere, sometimes they're older. And so we, we counsel with the fathers, especially those who are adolescent fathers to ensure that they themselves are maximizing potential, are accepting paternity, are not having a relationship with the girl. We're not, of course, encouraging that, but we're encouraging his family to assist the girl's family to ensure that this child is brought up in a wholesome kind of way and that the young mother herself also um, maximizes her potential. Thank you so much, Dr. Simpson. You that was a <laughs> bit of information um, and we'll continue um, to have uh, um, the, the conversation after. Um, the, the panel this evening is, is so rich in terms of, you know, the wealth of knowledge and what you're doing. And I'm sure that, you know, we can appreciate what the, the Women's Center um, is offering to our girls and our young men. And I'm, I'm happy that there's a balance where our, our, our young men are not left out of the picture, but because they too um, need the guidance and the mentorship. So yes. I'm now going to go over, thank you so much, Dr. Simpson. You're welcome, um, my pleasure. We're going to now go to Mrs. Coral Mason, a beautiful person, a beautiful name, guidance counselor with emphasis on career counseling and soft skills. And um, she's a job, placement and, and um, officer and a job coach with the Abilities Foundation. Um, Coral Mason has been a guidance counselor for 30 plus years and she has been working with the disabled youth for over 10 years as a job coach and a job placement officer. She has a passion for working with persons with disability and so at this time I'm going to invite um, Mrs. Coral Mason to share with us a little more about what she does um, with this group of wonderful young people that she gets the opportunity to work with. So, um, uh, Mrs. Mason, Ms. Mason, if you just come on now and share with us um, what your job entails and the impact that you're making um, in the lives of these young people. Um, let's make welcome Mrs. Coral Mason. Well, pleasant good evening, all. It is my pleasure to be a part of this distinguished panel, I thank you for inviting me. I'm a member of the Abilities Foundation family, as was said earlier. And you may ask, what is this? A lot of persons don't know about the Abilities Foundation. It's a registered volunteer organization and a community-based training institute with the Heart Trust NTA in Jamaica. The foundation was established to provide quality vocational education to persons with disabilities to enable them to function as creative and productive citizens. This institution is co-educational for persons 17 years and older. So unlike the Women's Center, when we get them, they are a little older. They are more to the 20s going into 30s. This evening, I want to share a little with you an ongoing problem of teenage pregnancy, which I can tell you is not immune to the disabled sector. But what we realize is that the deaf and intellectually disabled persons are more prone to pregnancy. You know, when they come to us a little bit under 20, they oftentimes already have multiple pregnancies. You will have like a 
18, 19 year old with already two pregnancies. And I realized that there are two main factors that contribute to our females under 20 becoming pregnant. One, I realized that there's a, a lack of knowledge on safe sex. Oftentimes, parents are, are afraid or are, are, are a bit timid to, to share with, with persons with disability. So I guess they just, just leave them, just leave them to the will. They are often, and because of this, they are often tricked into unprotected sex by their peers or older men, giving them old wife tales as to what they should do outside of the normal pregnancy preventing method. And sometimes because of their, 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 their disability, especially the intellectuals, they, they believe and their parents don't share with them. So they don't know. We may wonder in this day and age, they don't know, but yes, they, they really don't know. And the second one is financial shortfall. Because of their poor socioeconomic background, they are not able to financially navigate and negotiate for themselves. And because of this, they will have sex with whosoever will fulfill their financial need. Sometimes, just for a party oh. because they don't have it and somebody wanting to sh share with them, they feel that this person loves them. Based on my experience, I have noted that sometimes, and this might sound a little harsh, but sometimes parents contribute to them getting pregnant for financial gains. It's like they're, 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 they're giving them over so that they, can have what they need financially. You know, at this point in their life, when they come to us, all I can do is encourage and provide family planning, coping skills and career guidance so that they can charter their future from where they are. I try to help them to see, you know, where they are now, find out from them where they want to go and I help them to navigate this road. If, however, they become pregnant while they're at the institution, we facilitate them 100% and allow them to complete their course of study. And can I tell you that we have some real good success stories of girls having their child, successfully passing their exams, they graduate, they get a career and they do very well. And I feel like a proud mother. I get that sense of pride when they come back to school functions and, and or sometimes they'll drop by and they will give tangibly to the institution. And I feel fulfilled. Thank you so, so much. Oh yes, yes. Yeah, that's, 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 that's really commendable. Uh, what's your number like though approximately how many how many students you have in a given year okay in a given year we'll have like uh probably 40 50 students and they stay there for two years okay. so at any given time we have not more than 100 110 students what about the male versus female the ratio okay yeah. the ra we have probably about one to four you know male to female all right, so we will continue that conversation, um, Coral, as we go through the, the, con the, the, the discussion. So I'm going to know, um, because I want us to hear from all the panelists, and then we're going to go into a question and answer segment. So at this time, I'm going to be inviting um, Ms. Anna K. McIntosh, who is the General Secretary with the Youth Council of Jamaica, Lasco Chin Foundation, a social worker, and um, she is going to be sharing with us some of the scenarios that she encounters with teenage parents in her line of work. So I want to at this time welcome um, to our conversation, Ms. Anake McIntosh. Ms. McIntosh, if you'll just share with us some of your experience um, with, with teenage parents, we'd appreciate um, getting your point of view based on your line of work. 
I don't think um, Anna K is on yet. Um, I think oh, she isn't. On. I just so sent her the link, so maybe she's in the waiting room, so you could check. All right. So while we're waiting on on Miss McIntosh, I'm going to be um, inviting at this time a uh, uh, a teenager. Well, like all of us, she was once a teenager. She's now an adult, but. Uh, um, I'm going to be inviting Ms. Charlene Dixon, who currently serves as president of the St. Thomas Parish Council, president of the St. Thomas Parish Youth Council, and formerly served as a youth club aide in her parish. She was awarded the Prime Minister's Youth Award in the category of nation building in 2018. With a determination to further inspire and uplift the youth in her parish, Charlene started the youth Youth litification, youth litification. <laughs> which, which to date has impacted the lives of over 500 high school students. Um, she stated, I'm very passionate about youth and I love working with them. I'm excited about assisting the young people in my parish to grow into strong, positive forces in society. I am a cheerleader, so I always try to support and strengthen their efforts. I worked with over 500 youths during my first year at the Parish Youth Council by either giving back to their um, community, providing the grants for their back to school, or awarding them for their excellence. And she continues to say, I'll, co I'll, I'll continue to build and inspire Jamaica's youth population. Um, Charlene will share with us um, a little more about you know, her story because Charlene is speaking from the point of experience where she um, was also a teenage mom. And today she, from her experience, she's determined to make a difference and to say to you know, other young persons who might find themselves in this position or who might be even thinking about it, um, the, the different um, pathways that can lead to um, where, where they end up in terms of the choices they make, um, how they feel about themselves is at the end of the world. What, where do we go from here? And um, she's a voice that I think we all need to hear at this time. So I'm going to welcome uh, Miss Dixon to share with us her story. Miss Dixon, welcome to our panel discussion this evening. Thank you guys and um, good evening everybody. It's a pleasure being here. Um, firstly, I just want to say, um, babies are a blessing. Trust me, they are. They can either, it's always for good. It will build you. Some In the start, you will feel like you're going to be broken or whatever. But trust me, babies are a blessing when you look at it in the long run. Because back then, when I had my first, my first child, I was a bit, worried and a bit doubtful and a bit like I would just be just a girl with a child and no future behind it but I'm really happy I'm really glad that I didn't even think of doing abortion or try anything stupid I fight the odds and I play my role as a good mother the best way I can as a young mother and babies are a real blessing trust me Anyway, let me start. I got pregnant pretty early and it wasn't that smooth for me. It wasn't that smooth for me at all. Um, I didn't want to have a child until I was 30. That's what I wrote in my diary. I wouldn't get pregnant until I'm 30 when I have everything, when I be the ear hostess and I have a business and I have a big house in Cherry Gardens and I'm driving a car and I'm traveling, that's when I will have a child. But sex is there. Like I always tell my mentees, sex is there. And sometimes you may fight, fight not wanting to do it, but it is there. And if, if you're going to have a boyfriend and you're not strong, you can be strong, yes, but for how long or how long you're going to fight it and whatever. But Sex is there and it will happen. Things will happen. But if things do happen, and for example, in my situation, it wasn't like I was running up and down, having a lot of boyfriend. It was my first boyfriend, my first time, because I was trying my very best to hold out until I was old enough 
but it happened and I got pregnant and we were both young and we didn't know much about parenting. I didn't know anything at all about parenting, not one thing about parenting because I grew up with my grandmother. My mommy was always overseas. So I didn't really know much about parenting. So living, moving out and living with my child father now, um, I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to clean a house and make it sparkling and whatever. I just know how to clean a room. So now you're living in a whole house with a man and you may not do the things them need, like how oh, mother, him see mother do it and whatever. And him start like get aggressive by you for not doing certain things right. And all these things started and you get frustrated now and him start treat you bad, start cussing, start calling the dirty girl and no man not go want you. And this and all them something that break, just kind of break down your self-esteem and just make you feel like you're worthless and, and uh, this is the end for you. And you just feel like something, you just feel like you want any life. You want, you just want to be out of this God. This is not how you actually planned your future to be. Right. And then you start the beating the start, you lick up your head in a wall. People are passing an area, get beaten, and you eye things from your family until it reach a point that you just have to just let go and leave. Matters not. And when you do the first time I try to leave that relationship my, with my daughter's father, um him tell me every night, like nobody not gonna want to with baby. So if I'm like here, come back, cause nobody not take up no woman with no baby, and 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 have a work and them something. You know, it start playing. I'm like, yeah, true. I have one baby and and I'm in a work. So why me I go leave? Then I went back. I know my daughter was like two, and I realized she seen the abuse. And every time I try to hug her. I realized she started scream. So I realized that whenever he's fighting me and hold me a certain way, and she's witnessing that, she tend to think that if you're sure I love, it's something bad. So if you're oh girl, say, come here, baby, and give her a kiss on the forehead, she's just like, ah, scream out and a throw tantrum. And the man said, no, this serious, you can't hug her. And then I decided that no, I need, I need to take my own life in my own hands. And then I started working for a thousand dollars one time per week at this salon. And I chose my partner from that. And even though it wasn't much, it was a little push for me to move out and go back. My mommy was overseas and she had a house and I went there and lived by myself. It was scary and I, and I, and I still didn't know what to do now because now I'm a single, single mother because I'm living alone with my daughter. And I was working, I get somebody to keep her for me. And I still working a thousand dollars, you know that a thousand dollars don't do much. And I still was using pride and not saying anything to my mother until I decided to say to my mother. And my mother started, my mom started to help me. Okay, that was that. And I think I was getting a, a, a grip of life now because yes, mommy stepped in and I can't go to work and I have a babysitter. There goes again now because I built up myself in a little way. I think I was firm now and I got pregnant again by somebody different. This time was a police officer. But which you know, you get pregnant for a police officer, you think it's going to be better than the other one. So you think that, you know, you're safe now because it's a policeman. So you feel more safe with him. It was actually, actually, actually worse. The abuse starts again because I didn't know how to do anything. And the humiliation get worse. The beating get worse. And then the cheating while I was pregnant, somebody else pregnant. And I just like, you know what? I just feel worthless. Like, this is it. Me, I got just done my worthless little picnic on the road. And me just feel frustrated and done. But there was something in me that always pushing me. You can do better. And I started and I can do here. I'm a hairdresser. So I decided to start my own little business. I had a bracelet. My mommy gave it to me when I was 16. And I barely wear it and I had it in my drawer. And I decided that I'm going to sell this bracelet, going to Kingston tomorrow morning and sell this bracelet and started my own business. 
So I did, I went to Kingston and I tried to find the best cash for gold man to get the good amount of money when my team is supposed to get for that bracelet. And I get $21,000 and I started my ear business on my veranda. I started there and then I get a, then I come off the veranda and I went into a shop. Yes, sir. And I start then then I moved into Maran B. Was working with a friend. Then I went on my own. Then I have my own business. And I realized that no, I can do things for myself. I don't need to depend on any man for anything. And it really pushed me. And I really happy the day that I went to Kingston and sell that bracelet and started the business on my veranda because it really pushed me to want it to do more. And I realized that the more money I make, the more I can say, if you push yourself out, the more you will make more money. And so I did. And I started my own business. And then I said I wanted to do more for young people, especially in my community. I wanted to help them because there's a lot of teenage pregnancy in my community. Mm -hmm. And I realized they have potential, but they just wanted to sit down and gamble and just follow the pattern that they've seen in the community and and all this and so I wanted to bring about a change because if I could do it I said they can do it as well so I started giving free lessons at my shop yes until I get connected with art and they come in and they do the exam and they get the certificate if they want to stay and work at my salon they can stay and work at my salon then from there I started my charity which also still draw young people in my community and we do we give back to the community and we work with the elderly and it's fortunate because I realized these things help to build you Giving back and sharing your story, it helped to build you. Even though you're letting it out there, at the same time, you're building yourself. And then I decided I, wa decided I wanted to do something in school. So now I was, was um, nominated to be a part of the St. Thomas Parish Youth Council. I was vice president and I moved up to president. And then we started this school project called Youth Identificated. And trust me, um, when you get the feedback from kids in school, if kids in school don't have a strong um, support behind them, the cycle will continue and it will start at soon, start at a much earlier age, and it will come like nothing to them getting pregnant. It will feel like a norm. I don't know if this is happening everywhere in Jamaica, but the schools that I've encountered with, it feel like a norm to get pregnant, especially for the boyfriend that they claim they're so loving high school, but they don't really know the outcome when you get pregnant this young. So I try to be the driving force now to let them know that it's okay to have a boyfriend, but we need to draw a line. And if in any cases that you can't draw the line and things happen, flesh, take over and your kiss and it lead from kissing to whatever and you might get pregnant we're not saying you're supposed to go out there and get pregnant because i wouldn't say go out there and get pregnant but at the end of the day it's reality it's happening so we have to bring it across to them not saying to go and get pregnant but if it should happen that you get pregnant in school or get pregnant right after leaving high school don't give up you can further yourself, you can continue. Whatever little skill you have, work up on it and try not to be left behind because the moment you let yourself go in, 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 in a relationship so young, you might just end up doing the same things that you see everybody in the community doing. Gambling, cooking, going back home, gambling, cooking, going back home. And you need more for yourself, but you have to be the force to push yourself to get more out of it. And the, if you have a baby, it's not the end of the world. Because it wasn't, I thought it was not end of my world, but it wasn't the end of my world. I'm really happy I had my kids because maybe if I didn't have them at such early age, I wouldn't be so pushed to do so much. I'm putting myself out there to be um, someone that can come out and talk to young people and relate my story to them to help motivate them and help build them to the point they can call me and say they are going through this and what should they do and whatever I like that.
So that's just my story somewhat. Could go all the way in details, but that's that. And I'm really proud of where I am right now. And I'm really glad that I was asked to come on here tonight to share my two cents with the young people across Jamaica. And I really hope I can change somebody's way of life, the way they see a situation right now. They can look the other way and push and go out there and fight for what they believe in. Thank you so much, Ms. Dixon, for sharing. Um, they, they, you've made yourself vulnerable for the rest of our young people who might be where you were to understand that this is not, you're not promoting this, but you're saying if it happens to you, life goes on, chin up. Thank you. Yeah. We will continue the conversation as we go through um, the, the rest of the program. At this time, I, I want to welcome, we're looking at the flip side of this, and there is so much to talk about. And so we will, you'll be hearing some more as we um, get closer to the end of the program, as we look at our, um, other areas that we'll be focusing on in the series coming up. But I want at this time, thanks again, Ms. Dixon. I'm now going to be inviting um, one of our panelists who was a child in the story, whose mother was a teenager. And, um, and so he will now share his story about um, how he felt, what, it, what life was like from his side. I want you, um, ladies and gentlemen, to, to make welcome um, one of our, our next panelists um, who will be coming um, shortly after um, Donna Morton, who will share um, um, an extension to, to what Ms. Dixon would have shared. So we want to hear the different angles different ages, different stages, the triumphs, the trials, what has it been like? And um, how, how, how do we now um, say to persons who are even contemplating, um, is this the way for me? Because a boy might have asked, um, asked you to, to um, prove that you love me um, by having sex. What choice do I make? And what are the possible consequences? But um, to also say to you, if you're in that position right now where you made that choice and you find yourself as a teenage um, parent, whether male or female, um, it's not the end of the world. Um, you, can, you can pick yourself up. You can um, move forward and make, make your life um, that of a better person and not bitter and also make a contribution, a positive contribution to your community, your country and your world. And so I'm gonna be inviting at this time, um, Ms. Donna Morton Morgan, who is the CEO and president and founder of the Caribbean American Diaspora Alliance, Women of Culture Organization, who herself was a teenage mother, but she has a story to share as to how she got here and what is happening in her life today. And so right before we have um, the, the, another speaker sharing with us his story as the, the child of a teenage mother, we now invite um, our next panelist to share with us. So Mrs. Morton Morgan, welcome. And um, thank you for, for, for being willing to share with the rest of us your story. Certainly, certainly. Good, ev good evening, everyone. I won't be long because I know we're, we're into um, time frame thing. You know, I think everything in life happens for a reason. And I think each of us on this earth has a story to share. We have a purpose in life. If you notice that when someone has a can or decides to do a cancer organization, they first experience a family member or themselves that had the situation or the disease which propelled them to share. So we have to just learn to take our mess and turn it into a message, right? And all of our messes are gonna be different and all our messages are gonna be very different, but that should be our purpose. So for me, you know, I've always been a, a strong, mindset kind of a person from a young girl I knew I was I was a little different and I would talk to ghosts and things like that right so I knew I was very different <laughs> are you saying we are ghosts yes 
I used to, so I left Jamaica when I was five years old and we moved to the British Virgin Islands. So, you know, for that, the, the, your front yard was a lot of graves and all that kind of stuff playing as kids. So for me, talking to ghosts was, was very normal. So, and I thought even going through high school, um, that I was very strong. And the thing is, I was so strong that I didn't even date guys my age. I only dated older men. And because I also worked in a, in a company that it was, I was probably maybe two, you know, only two or three teenagers in that company. So my surrounding was always older. They took me to happy hour with them on Wednesdays. So I just kind of got into that lifestyle with hanging out with older people. So I dated, you know, my, my boyfriend would come pick me up at school while everybody was being dropped off, things like that. So you know, I lived with my aunt that raised me. So, you know, she, she's older. She didn't really have control of certain things. Once you start, once you walk and say you're walking to school, first of all, your parents don't know who's picking you up down the street. So those are my decisions that I made. Uh, but the influence of having an, an older person, 10 years older, actually, um, played its way. And I was smart enough to know that I, I needed to get on, on birth control. But his influence was like, no, 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 you know, so I, I listened to him and I, I got pregnant. We ended up getting married. Um, and I actually, um, three, three children later, we were together um, and, and struggling as a young family. But, you know, he, he had his demons. He had his alcohol and, and, and at that time, crack and, and so forth. So he was fighting his demons. And I know that, you know, we couldn't get far doing that. So uh, unfortunately, our relationship was rocky. He tried to hit me and then I plotted to kill him um, because I'm just like that, you know. I'm just, <laughs> so I figured, you know, what, this is not going good. So um, but he eventually, you know, um, I ended up having to walk away my with the, I had a, a very supportive family that was one thing and so my family would help me I I walked away from from the relationship eventually uh, actually I I got pregnant with my last and my beautiful son and I made a pact with God and I said God you know I was really planning to leave this this man and now I'm pregnant again and I said if I keep this child you will have to lead the way and so I basically made a pact with God. And from that day on, and I was 26 at the time with my third child, I had my first child at, at 18, right after my, my birthday. And um, from that day of making that pact, it's like I had people in place at every cornerstone of my life. Before I finished school, I had a job lined up it's been like that throughout ever since. So I used to take the pictures of those three little babies, every job that I went to, and I would have them on my desk. And they were my motivating factor for going forward in life and for accomplishing. I went on from to be a paralegal. And, and my husband used to rip up my, my homework. So it was not always easy. He used to rip up my homework because there was some kind of threat but you know, I went on to become a paralegal. And after that, I used to see people going on vacations and I'm like, I know I, I wanna have that life too. And I went on to be a real estate broker. I, from that, I went on to be an investor and I bought six houses. And this, this was all being a single mom coming from Jamaica with, with, you know, with nothing. And, but it took a mindset that I didn't know I was even developing to, to encourage myself and to, there were plenty of times that I could have made the wrong decisions. A lot of that is gonna come at you as a, as a young mom and you, you have to have a mindset to say, okay, no, this is the way I'm going or to be in tuned uh, a relationship with God to know that, okay, you are my best friend you are my best friend when I don't have anyone else. So, so I made that connection early on in my life where I could talk and, and build a relationship. 
And now my children, you know, they know the story. They, we are just so close because they saw me go through the struggles with them in tow. They saw my accomplishments and, and they push me. When I'm down, they push me. So those are my blessings. Though They're my forever love. And no matter what, I would not trade my life for anything else. Um, so even though as a single mom or dad or a young mom or, you know, a teenage, it's going to be hard. It's not easy. It is not easy, but your support system can help you. Not always. You don't always have that but if you have the right support system but i always tell everybody you have to be your own best friend because you may not have the support system to rally you and to encourage you and to push you you can you're going to be the only one to choose am i going to go down the road of taking drugs or doing this you know or am i going to go to school so your mentality and you have to learn to empower yourself and encourage yourself and love yourself enough to know this happened, but my babies are not a mistake and they're a blessing, you know? So that is my story. And um, that's why I take, I use my life now to encourage others and to uplift and as much as I can, because I know what it is and I've been there. And I, sometimes I look at myself in amazement and just like, Jesus, wow, you know, to see where I'm coming from, but it's not an easy road but you can do it. Thank you so much for sharing. So, so inspiring. I, I really appreciate that because not many persons have that kind of growth mindset to say I'm here, but I can move. I can move from here. It is hard, but I, I, I'm, I can make um, better a better life for myself, for my child. Thanks again for sharing with us. Yeah, and we'll to, thanks, we will invite you to you know, to talk with us some more as we get to the question and answer section. And at this time, I'm going to be welcoming um, a child who is no longer a child, but um, his story. Um, you are the child of a teenage mother. What was life like for you? What did life look like for you? And so at this time, I want us to, to make welcome um, and I'm sure he'll tell you that it was not just him, but I'll, I'll leave that for him. So um, our sixth panelist, fifth so far, we will go back to um, Anake as soon as we have um, heard from Dr. Dwayne Dice. We want to make welcome Dr. Dr. Dice, good to have you, educator and chair for the J.D. Tan Educational Task, Task Force. Dr. Dwayne Dice grew up in Murray Mountain in St. Anne and currently lives in Washington, DC. He has a doctorate in educational leadership and works at a charter school in the DC area. He's also a motivational speaker and writer. I'm sure you have a copy of your book to show us, um, um, Dr. Dice. No, oh, he's a current chair of the Jamaica Diaspora Educational Task Force and um, what we want to know, hear from you, um, um, Dr. Dice, what was it like for you as a child with a teenage um, mother? What was, was, was your father there? What was it like? Um, let's hear your story. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, it's sort of a, it's not really a privilege <laughs> this year. I, I, want, I, I, I don't really take pride in sharing my story so much more than oh it is a it's it's ease it's ease to share because um uh people kind of learn from you once they share your story um they my 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 own story started um it was fairly early uh when i i i started questioning where i was from when i was about 10 years old and um I started, I, I grew up with my grandparents though. I was born in Kingston in Jubilee Hospital. And uh, when I was born, I, I was born a twin. So I have an identical twin brother. And uh, so I, I, I'd rather start when I was 10 and I started questioning because before then I was having the happiest time of my life. And 
I didn't know that. There's one other part of it too, is that I grew up without my father. Um, and I didn't know my father until I was 20 years old. The same thing with my brother. But I didn't know the, uh, the, the implications or influence of not, not having a father. And by extension, I didn't grow up with my mother also. Uh, she stayed in Kingston when we started growing up with our grandparents. So we had our grandparents, uh, Mama Lucy and Mafford. Somebody will tell them about this because somebody is watching Facebook right now. They always, every time I appear somewhere, they, they hear. So I grew up in that beautiful little city in the village in Murray Mountain. Um, and I started questioning when I was around 10 or so because there's no Indians around the area there. We were the only mixed Indian um, uh, children growing up, my brother and I. And we started wondering where we're from. And uh, it took us a long time to figure out what, what happened. And the, the answers weren't forthcoming. We tried to ask questions and nobody would say anything until it was uh, um, when I was a teenager I started digging for information when I was about um, 18. Started digging for information. I started doing research on my own when I did Caribbean history in high school. I started figuring out where, are, where these people are in the Middle Passage and so on. And I started, I traced, because I grew up, my grandmother is black. So I, I grew up with her, I traced her family all the way back to the, the, um, the enslaved people in Clarkstone, Trelawney from the, the hills of Moore Mountain to Clarkstone. And then I sat with my grandfather. My grandfather is Leon, his last name is Leon. He's half Chinese or one third Chinese. And his people, they're from one section of the, his family is from China with the Leon, the father's side. And the other side is um, mixed with Bowman from Germany. And so I, I, I understand where they're from so I started wondering, um, so if my grandmother, who is black, she's from the slaves in Trelawney, um, and then my grandfather, where I grew up from, um, is from the, in, the Chinese and um, German. Where, where am I from? Because my father is, must be a, an Indian guy. And I asked my mom and she said, yeah, he's Indian. Your grandfather is living in Kingston. And so I need to meet them. You know, I demanded answers. And this is what I tell young people all the time. If you need to demand answers from your people. You need to demand because you need to know your roots so that you can operate on a more firm basis. And the philosopher Bob Marley said that you need to know where you're coming from or else you'll never know where you're going. Mm -hmm. So I demanded answers and the answers came. And I started asking my mom now questions. But she got pregnant with us when she was um, 18 because she had us when she was 19. And she was in school in Kingston. And um, so the father I had, uh, probably, I don't know where I was conceived, probably 15 minutes of great pleasure and everything else, and then I came. And uh, so it probably, probably, uh, I really don't know. And um, I'm grateful for the idea of being in existence because I can make a difference in so many people's lives. So that's where I'm from, basically. Um, from a teenage pregnancy and a single parent let alone a child who didn't even graduate from high school yet and then struggle through the ages coming all the way up to where I am now, which I, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for everybody. Now, the thing I want to say is you have to seek, as a, as a, um, a person of single parent family, you have to seek help from outside the family. You, you cannot just um, have your family and group. You, you will never make it inside a single parent family, you never make it. And I made a part, just a final note here, I made a part with myself that I will never have a child until I can take care of that child and be there for her. And that is why I waited until I was 30 years old to have my little daughter. And she's playing now, so I'll bring her on screen to see. She's very excited, I'm totally in her life, I'm showing up everywhere. Every time I give a talk at a graduation, she's standing right next to me. And, um, and the, the rapport is very good. Um, I introduce her to so many different other things, even though she's seven years old. 
So that's where I am really right now. Um, my whole thing that I'm contributing to, those things really and professional life means nothing to me if I'm not a good father, basically. So that, that's where I am. Um, do you think that, that this is coming from not having your father, just wanting to be the best father possible because your father was not there? Um, well, the drive, the drive I had um, for especially um, giving back to community and society comes from my mentors. Um, I will jump at anything to give back, that, that drive. Um, they usually say to me that uh, you're going to be well if you create community. Um, so the, the primary focus I got from them um, is, and, and young, um, men in my life, and one of the primary ones was um, Bishop Charles Dufour, who retired, Archbishop of Kingston. He's basically a, a primary father figure in my life. And he would sit down as a spiritual father and say to me that um, this is all you need to operate. Um, when you're in public, this is all you need to operate. And um, Archbishop Charles um, used to just sit and talk to my, myself and my brother. He's the one who pushed me to, um, to stay focused on education because he said to me one time that um, education is the only thing that will get um, people out of poverty. And the problem is that many of us are not, um, we're not willing to take the sacrifice because you have quite a few sacrifices that you have to make. But, but the, the father, the, the drive comes from those people. Um, guidance counselors at school, principals. Um, the, the one, the last one that spoke to me was the high school principal at Abutna Gallimore High School, um, Mr. Sharp. And he retired, he retired already. Um, he, when he came to the school, he sat down and we spoke. I used to live in his office a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So you see time. the impact of, of, of male, of, of, of having the male figure there made the difference. Um, oh yes, yes, um, definitely. Yes. My, my grandfather too, my grandfather taught me a whole lot um, when I was growing up too. A mm -hmm. lot to be tough, to build things, don't just, um, depend on other men in the community. If you need something, you reach out to them. Try build it yourself. And I got a lot of tapping on my finger with the hammer to build um, the rabbit um, coop, the chicken mm -hmm. coop, um, pig pen. Uh, I did. I went all out. Yes. I think it's so important. Thanks so much, Doctor Dice. That we understand that if the father is not there, that you know the, the male in the family, male around can step in and play that role. And I think it's, it's, it's a really crucial point for our men to understand the, the importance that they can play in the life of a child with an absent father. Um, thanks, Dr. Dice, for sharing. We will continue that conversation. I know we'll invite uh, Ms. Anake McIntosh. We were not able to get her on earlier um, based on internet challenges, but we now have her. And so I'm gonna ask uh, Mrs. Ms. Anake McIntosh, thank you for coming in and sharing with us your, your side of the story working with um, teenage parents. Thank okay. you for having me. You're welcome. Um, I'm honestly struck. I think after those stories, I'll just be the benediction, but I'll try my best. So my interaction with teenage parents over the past years have led to three main components that I have identified with. And I'm very grateful for this conversation. I must say congratulations to the team because many times you hear the conversation, it's trickled towards um, don't, you know, not the do's, but the don'ts. And the, there's not necessarily a do and don't the team with pregnancy, but the conversation is why it shouldn't happen and why it should never happen again. But in the midst of it happening, the way forward is important. So I'm very glad that this conversation is showing that there's also two sides to, you know, Miss Donna's story and Charlene's story and Dr. Dye's story. Um, the three components though that I've seen impacting are would have been fundamental in some of the underlying causes to persons that I've encountered with teenage pregnancy normally stem from similarly to what Dr. Dice will mention, the gap in the physical environment, the emotional, mental environment, as well as the negligence. Now, that synopsis story that you, you regularly hear where persons discuss that 
or the father was absent from the family or the mother was busy working and they were influenced by friends or they never really got around to people loving them or they didn't really understand it. There's a common gap that I have seen in the person that I've worked with that goes in line with those three factors, the physical environment, the emotional environment, and the negligence. Now, the physical environment, and I try to be very sharp with policy, the physical environment speaks to what is present in the home. So we know that the father being absent does play a significant role on many persons. Um, not just the father, but the male figure that would help to put forward that kind of encouragement or that kind of significant responsibility of the male in their life. When that is missing, there is a no gap. Many persons may try to distinguish that. It's not necessarily a needed thing if the mother is playing the mother father role or if whatever the scenario may be. However, the father carries a weight or that male figures carry a significant weight in the lives of children and young adults and teenagers, which influences the decisions that they do encounter as they go through their teenage years. The mental environment now is for those who are present around the child or around the teenager and what they are being fostered. So similar to Charlene who felt that she, was, she wasn't needed or she wasn't that important or she can't go make it or she can't bother. You have persons who encounter all of that before even approaching the relationship to become pregnant. So they battle with that now and then they become in contact with somebody who provide them with a 15 minute of pleasure or that 20 minutes of love, peace and just belonging where they feel comfortable and so they become coincide with that. Then the negligence where these persons are being pressured, they are being ignored, their emotional, their mental state is not stabilized and all the factors that play into that are being ignored. So the main thing is that you're, you're eating, you're, you're, you're fed, you go to school and you come home on the scene. Um, you go to church on Sunday, you watch the plate, you do what you're supposed to do. Mm. But then there's that, 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 that little ignorant gap that goes missing that isn't really considered as the most important part of the growing process especially within those teenage years that goes missing. And so these are those three other terms that I put together, being identified within this group that has contributed somehow to the factor. Not this noting that peer pressure, a lot of them have fallen short of peer pressure. A lot of them um, took on the whole experimental course, of course, you know, millennials, even before millennials, have been very experimental persons, um, despite the cultural background that they're from and the, the persons that they see struggling and the experiences that they encounter, they have a lot of them that will still put themselves in that position to be a teenage mother because of other influences that they would have seen or heard that encourage that the situation will be a pleasant one. And so they actually put themselves out there. Additionally, there is the ones that the whole concept in Jamaica. As much as we think it's dying out, it's very present where a child can tie a man, right? So you have a lot of teenagers in a specific community that I was engaged with where scammers were very active. And this was one of the main way in which teens and females got about um, being financially stable. Because a lot of them didn't work and a lot of them really didn't have the qualification to work. They either dropped out of school early or they stopped at the high school level and they didn't proceed any further and they didn't have any qualification to go further on in their educational career. So the scammers were a very integral part of that community and the relationships. Most of the teenage relationships were of teenagers being with scammers. Now, the connotation that I got interested in from that community was that if you are increasing the schema, if you aren't doing what you're supposed to do, eventually you will be worn out of you and want another female. However, if you have a child for that schema, then you will eventually have to continuously mine your ticket your fund you financially. So the, the culture in it, the, 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 the background in which it is informed, um, the, the, 
the culture can't emphasize the culture anymore because in this specific community, it wasn't an issue. And of course, as social science, um, psychology, social workers, we know that you can't work on an issue unless the person has identified that it is an issue. However, it is not an issue in some communities specifically like this. And so these are some of the things that I've seen coming up with some of the teenagers that I've encountered in my mind. Thank you so much for sharing, Anike. We appreciate your side of the story. Um, there's so many sides to the story, and yeah. what I want us to, you know, keep um, bearing in mind, emphasizing, reiterating: we're not promoting teenage pregnancy. We're saying, look, this is not the path to take. There, 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 there are many, many, many challenges on this path. But understand that if you find yourself here, it's not the end of the world. But if we, if you were to give the advice to a teenager this evening who has not yet um, had a child, but um, for whatever reason they are contemplating it, um, as we go into the program, I want you, you know, different persons, um, to to share. What would you say, especially um, from from Miss Morgan and um, and Anna and um, Charlene, you know. What advice did you give to a young person who is contemplating this path because they feel unloved, because they're struggling with self-esteem issues? Because many times we find the need to be accepted is, is, is so strong that you're pulled into something that you don't really want to get into or based on the different needs that would have been discussed. And so at this time, I will thank you so much, Anike, for sharing with us. I'm going to now invite um, a clinical psychologist who can better, you know, talk to us um, as it relates to, you know, sometimes some of the things that we are still grappling with as adults, because we don't really understand why, you know, some of our teenagers would make that choice or why we even as teenagers uh, made some of the choices and not just that, but, you know, how do we go forward? So I want to welcome at this time, Dr. Beverly Gordon, who earned her doctoral degree in clinical psychology. Um, she earned her master's in counseling psychology and her bachelor's in nursing education, a very, very good combination that gives her the authority to speak to us um, this, this, on this topic of um, teenage development stages in the Jamaican culture. And so she's currently employed by the Crozer Keystone Health System as a child and family therapist, and also teaches psychopathology in the School of Graduate Studies at Chest. Chestnut Hill College. She's a frequent presenter at seminars, workshops, and retreats, and um, relates to mental health and relationships. She's originally from Kingston and attended NCU in Mandeville. She taught at Mannings Hill and a Claremont All Age School, and she's the current chair of the Jamaica Diaspora Health Task Force. I want us to make welcome Dr. Beverly Gordon as she shares with us from an informed position based on her area of specialization. Dr. Gordon, it's good to have you on the program. Welcome. Dr. Gordon. Um, all right, so. Thank I, you so much. Thank you so oh, much, <laughs> Ms. Wilmot. Thank you. You know, I, I was listening with such interest to the, to the other individuals who spoke about um, teenage pregnancy and teen parenting, because it's interesting that when we talk about teenage pregnancy, we tend to focus on the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that parenting is a challenging endeavor that really requires a complex set of skills. And one of the most important factors that I find is the developmental stage of the teenager. So teen, teen years is a time when individuals are seeking um, an identity and actually making that transition from childhood to adulthood. And this person who is in this transition stage between childhood and adulthood must now face the responsibility of being a parent, which is an adult role. So what happens is that the person's um, development actually gets interrupted. It gets interrupted in a way that challenges their ability to successfully make the transition from childhood to adulthood. Um, teen parenting is on the decline, I'm happy to hear, 
However, the numbers are still not encouraging. Mm -hmm. And so what, is, what are some of the um, reasons why, why teenagers continue to become pregnant? Lack of knowledge um, on safe sex. I heard one of the speakers talk about, I think it was Miss Mason, who talked about um, you know, the parents who don't tell their children about sex and sexuality. And so the children go out with um, a deficit in, in their knowledge, which causes them to make certain choices, or in fact, causes them to do certain behaviors that are not even based on choice at all, because they've not actually been, uh, they don't actually have the opportunity to develop mm -hmm. the skill of decision making before they're forced into situations where, you know, their decision is critical to the rest of their lives. Um, peer pressure. Uh, and you know that during the teen years, your peers are the most important influence. And so if, depending on the culture and the context in which the teen is living, um, they might be influenced, you know, everybody else is doing this. And the, the strange thing is that a lot of times when you talk to, the, to young people and they have this feeling like everybody else is doing this. And then the reality of it, everybody else is not doing that. It's a whole lot of talk. So there's more talk than action, but they don't know that. And then, um, unfortunately, you know, on the one hand, we talk about teenagers who there's something called teen love. They really believe that they're in love, and they sometimes they really are. And then, sex is a natural outcome of two people feeling as if they're in love, and so it happens. So it's not always something that happened suddenly or, or without, um, without any thought on, on the teenager's part. Actually, some teenagers choose to become pregnant. Again, depending on the type of culture that, that, that they're living in, what is accepted, what is the norm, there's something that's called um, generational transmission. So maybe that's what has come down through the, through the generations, you know, and that's what they see around them. And it just seems like the norm. There's nothing strange here. There's no problem. Why do you all think this is a problem? <laughs> you know, um, so there's always that. Um, and then unfortunately, there's sexual abuse, which is so very rampant in yeah. our society. And so an, a teenager without any choice on their part might become pregnant. And the, the, the thing is that teenage pregnancies has um, more potential for physical, mental, and social difficulties and challenges than pregnancies at other times of the life. So in the physical area, for example, teenagers are more susceptible to complications such as high blood pressure and a condition called preeclampsia during pregnancy. And because of this stage at which their, their bodies, the developmental stage of their bodies, their bodies are general, depending on the, on the age, because when we're talking about a 17 year old or an 18 year old, that's very different than talking about a 13 year old or a 14 year old. Because the 13 year old generally, in general, has just entered into puberty and their, their body is not yet fully developed or even ready to bear a child physically. Um, mentally, we found that individuals who become pregnant as teenagers have a higher risk factor for developing postpartum depression. And even just, um, and I don't mean just, but even just depression. And so these individuals, because of their, because of the hormonal changes and also because of their life situation, all those factors combined makes it, um, make them more susceptible to developing um, postpartum depression, which will not only affect the teen themselves, but also their children. Um, and then socially, I really want to emphasize the social aspect because the outcome of the situation of being a teen um, parent, the outcome is gonna depend on the type of social supports that the teens receive. And I think we heard evidence of that in some of the stories that we heard earlier on. So mm -hmm. the, the teen is experiencing, for example, interruption in education. If there's someone um, like Miss Zoe Simpson <laughs> who will help these young people to recognize that this is not the end of the world. Um, actually, we can work through this process of being pregnant, having this child. And by the way, we tend to focus on the girl a lot, but as someone else said earlier also, there's a girl and a boy involved here. And so helping this boy and this girl to recognize that they still have 
more to do in terms of their development. This is just an interruption. So let's find a way to actually get through this. Let's find a way to climb the mountains and, and forge the challenges and then get back on track. Um, not, not to regard their child as a, as a mistake, as, as was mentioned earlier, no mistake. Um, the child should not be re, re, um, the child should not be thought of as a mistake. The child is a person, a life, and you are now responsible for this child. You, as you go through your further process of development, must now also be responsible for this child, both the male and the female, because both the male and the female are necessary to the proper development of the child. Even though there are some researchers who would tell us differently, but that's a whole nother topic. Um, then the teenager, the teenager um, also is going to probably experience financial concerns because they don't have a job. They, they, they don't have the qualifications to get a job usually. And even if they do get a job, it's not going to be a well-paying job. So there are financial concerns. In some families, if a, if a teenager gets pregnant, they get put out of the family. And so now they lose their family support and they're on their own. And I, I always say to, to parents, I strongly recommend that you do not put your child out of your house for something like that or for anything similar. Because when you put the child out of the house, where are you sending them to? Where are they supposed to go? What are they supposed to do? So this child who may have gotten pregnant for the first time or, or whatever, now you put them out there and they have to find somebody who will support them or, you know, give them a place to live or provide money or whatever. And that usually leads to much more serious situations. So during this time is a critical time for parents to continue to be supportive of their children. They're going to have, they're not prepared to be parents. They are children themselves. They have not made the transition to adulthood yet. They do not have the cognitive um, development that would allow them to, to act in the, in, the, um, mature, in the mature way that a parent needs to, needs to act. And so sometimes we criticize the young mothers and the young fathers mm -hmm. because really they're not at that developmental stage. And I wanna emphasize this quite a bit. Sometimes the things that they do and the decisions that they make, even in terms of discipline, for example, sometimes it's simply that they're not mature enough to take on that role. So the adults, and the mature ones in the community, in the family, in the churches, yes, in the churches. If instead of being critical and judgmental, we would find a way to be supportive and to show the love of God to these young people, we might help them to get back on track to their ultimate destiny. Because sometimes young people get derailed and then it seems as if, you know, they weren't here for a purpose, but everybody's here for a purpose. And if we can find a way to help these young people to find their purpose and to make out oh, uh, one of my friends, Adana said um, something about take your mess and make it into a message. That's what we need to help our young people to do. So they need not just the physical support of actually getting through the pregnancy and overcoming some of the um, dangers and difficulties that arise in that way, not just the mental aspect of it that can lead to depression and postpartum depression, but they need that social support, a strong social network with family, educators, the church, the community. And this may give the teen a better opportunity to complete their education, to remain motivated, to complete the developmental task of transition to adulthood, non-judgmental, consistent support and mentoring from, again, I'm gonna say the church and the community, it's a plus. Individual personality, resilience and values can also assist the teen in successfully navigating the ups and downs of teen pregnancy and teen parenting to go on and live successful lives and raise children who in turn, as we've seen some examples tonight, who in turn can become well-adjusted, productive adults. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon. Um, a, a beautiful end to um, a program that I'm sure that, you know, time would not be enough to go into all the areas. And so I really want to, you know, say thank you to all the panelists and just before I hand over to Ms. Shernet Bailey, who will be um, taking, taking it from here, I want to say to you know, all our young people, 
um, boys and girls, remember that the greatest, the wisest person is not the one who made the mistake and learned from it, but the one who learned from others. So you would have heard the struggles, you would have heard um, the, the journey um, that, that was shared, but know also that if you are on that journey where you're a teenage parent, it's not the end of the world. You have greatness in you. Um, look at who you are as a person and who God created you to be and um, just get up, pick the pieces up and, and go out and make a positive contribution to society and do this for yourself and for your child. I now want to um, once again thank you for joining us and to hand over to Miss Charlotte Bailey. Miss Bailey, thank you for having me this evening. Absolutely, Ingrid, thank you so much. And thank you everybody on the panel. I mean, give yourselves a round of applause. I'm sitting literally in the edge of my seat. What a powerful, dis it really was absolutely fabulous. The discussion was spot on and it's so timely too, right? Because we've seen the rising numbers of incidents of molestation, incest. And yes, Zoe did mention that the numbers are going down in terms of teen pregnancies, but we have other incidents that are driving and potentially will blow your little 2%, I'm sorry, Zoe, out of the waters and bring it back to the numbers that are far less encouraging, as Dr. Beverly said. Um, I'm sure, Nick Bailey, I'm the chair for the Parenting and Other Abled Persons Empowerment Task Force with JD Tan. And we feel like it's an important topic to be discussed. We will be having a series of discussions following up on this one. Um, so please stay tuned for that just to kind of explore more some of the um, incidents of teenage pregnancies from the male perspective, as well as the female perspective in Jamaica particularly, because we do know that culturally it's a challenge and mm -hmm. there are certain things that are out of control and out of their control too. I mean, I'm, I think it was Anna Kay who mentioned the economical benefits, if you will, of aligning with a scamming type of environment for the money to come in. It's, you know, for the deaf and persons who are who are disabled in some aspect or the other, that's a challenge too, because it gets back to, okay, now where's your value? And if you're not getting the support, you feel less than, and you end up taking on this additional challenge, not necessarily a burden, but a challenge that it's not always the best situation. I, I remember I was having a conversation with a young man this week. He became a parent at 17. He had his plans, he had his goals. When he found out that he was gonna be a parent, that's it, everything just died, stopped in, in, the, in his tracks. He left school, um, tried to get a job and to take care of his girlfriend and their child. He's now 21. He's without a job because of COVID and just circumstances being very hard when you have a family to support. He feels like, you know, he's at his, the end of his ropes, but he still wants to take care of his family. And the support is there. You know, we saw that through what Zoe mentioned and what Coral also mentioned and everybody. Um, we want to expose some more of these incidents and to the, the idea behind this really is to get all the resources together, bring awareness to the challenge and the resources that are available. So thank you again, everybody for joining us. Thank you, Zoe Simpson, uh, Donna Morgan, Dr. Beverly Gordon, Ingrid Wilmot for doing a fabulous job of moderating. I just love the fact that we've got so many powerful voices. We've got Coral Mason, Anna Kay, and of course, Charlene, thank you so much for sharing. And I, I'm not sure if Dwayne is still on, but Dr. Dice, thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing with us. And the same for you, Charlene and Donna. It's important that these young people see and understand that it has happened in the past. It will probably happen again, but you're not alone. Just understand that it's not the end of the world, but let's not make it a norm, okay? Thank you all so much again, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And you have a blessed and safe evening. Actually, it's night for everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. It was a pleasure. Thank you.
Hi, Donna. Hi, Dr. Gordon. Hello. I'm leave it on saying hi. <laughs> long time, Anake. <laughs> too long. I know, I know. <laughs> Take care. Yeah, man. Bye. All right, bye. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.